All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. So great to see so many familiar faces, so many new faces. It's absolutely a wonderful time here. Um, start by introducing myself. My name is Chris McCurdy. I'm a principal solutions architect specializing in uh, healthcare and life sciences. And I'm very fortunate today to be sharing the stage with Rich Rodolfo here, who is the Senior Director of Operations and Infrastructure at Philips. We're going to be talking about a lot of stuff today. First, we're going to talk about why we're here, what makes this session different than the other IoT sessions that are taking place. Then it's almost dinner time, so we're going to make some soup. Then we're going to talk through some use cases, both at a high level, lower, and as technical as we can go. And then finally, Rich is going to come and talk about his experience at Philips doing IoT devices in a regulated space on AWS. Before we go too far, let's talk about the related breakouts. The first one, unfortunately, you're going to need a bit of a time machine for. Happened uh, a few hours ago. This is HLC 302. This session uh, really talks about automating your compliance, building a con continual compliance environment. Really dovetails nicely with what we're going to be talking about. Recommend you uh, look it up on YouTube afterwards and see what uh, they had to talk about. Tomorrow, we have SEC 302. This is a chalk talk, so it's a really interactive session for how to prepare for working with your, your auditors in a cloud context. Uh, Thursday, if you haven't had experience building IoT devices on AWS, there's a great session that really takes you from the nuts and bolts of using IoT core and how to build that up um, in the AWS environment. And then Thursday, the session that I am really looking forward to, SEC 330, this is a Chad Wolf talk with several other folks talking about automating compliance with automated mathematical proofs. I'm a compliance nerd. This stuff is super cool for me. So hope to see you all there. Now let's get into why we're here. I'll give you a quick little discussion of what my journey was to get to this conversation. I had a friend of mine who called me up. He works with, um, well, he's a, a school teacher, works with middle school kids, and he's part of a class, and they're doing a science project. So he asked me if I'd come and talk about IoT, what they're doing in that, in that space, in that environment. I said, great, absolutely. So normally when I have these conversations, it's normally, you know, here's your light device, your, your basic sensors, things like that. I showed up at the school, and they had this really cool elaborate garden environment with all these moisture sensors within the, within the soil. So they could then see, okay, um, what was the effect of watering the soil? How long did it take the water to go down through the soil? Um, what was the effect on rain? All that sort of stuff. And I was like, wow, that's pretty, pretty darn cool. And so I left. And then a few weeks later, I was like, hey, come on back. We're doing some stuff with robotics. Love to talk with you about robotics. Cool. So I, I show up at the school. They have a little, little robot, so like a, a little like an automated vacuum with a little trowel on the back of it that's going up and down and plowing their little garden space. I'm like, okay, middle schoolers have a more productive and functional garden than I possibly have. This is, this is amazing. I said, so what are, you, what are you planning next? And they said, okay, well, we kind of want to explore the green idea a little more, and so what we're going to do is try to build a giant potato battery to power our robot. And I, so the, for folks who don't know, you can take potatoes, you can stick a zinc rod into it, a, a copper rod into it, and you can chain them all together to build a giant mesh to power things up. And so they're going to build a giant battery, a potato battery, to power this little device. This is over like 300 or 400 potatoes all chained together in this mesh to make this happen. I was like, holy smokes, this is, this is pretty cool. And it really made apparent, really tactfully apparent to me how much this stuff is exploding. These are middle schoolers who are doing this awesome activity. And then I go home and then I look at things and I see, well, that this is, we'll skip that, this is, uh, this is going across consumer goods, right? So I walk in my house. What happens when I walk in my house? My door recognizes me, it lets me in, it sets my thermostat to the temperature I like, it sets the fans to the speeds I like, it turns the radio on, my car knows where I like my seat, all that sort of stuff that's almost ubiquitous across consumer goods, across factories. We talk a lot about industrial 4.0 revolution. Think of the robotics now in factories. You walk in the factories, robots are moving things everywhere. You have security cameras that are looking for hazard detection for people out of place. You have uh, controls on the emissions now in, in factories that are looking for if the volatile compounds are going too high or too low, automatically adjusting within all those constraints. And then in my favorite, within the research world, I mean, uh, somewhat embarrassingly, but realistic, there's a lot of equipment that's super expensive that really communicates over old pen and paper. People use this really expensive equipment, take notes, walk it over to their limb system, go to their limbs and punch in all the information. It's, it's not connected, but that's changing dramatically. You're seeing these IoT-based uh, old school devices, new school devices, all creating this connected limbs where you have a complete dashboard of everything that's taking place within the laboratory, creating this sort of heartbeat or environment um, across it. So let's take uh, an example. Uh, for those who don't know, this is a, a tablet press. Essentially what it does is it takes active ingredients, it takes coatings, things like that, 
presses them together into a tablet form and then expels it into a basket. Uh, if you've ever like, made cake or frosting, you can think of a press as essentially where you push it through, it creates the shape. It's kind of what this does, except in the tablet form. These things spin super fast. This one is about 40 years old. It exerts about 250 to a million, or sorry, 250,000 to a million tablets per hour. So quite, quite a powerful machine. But there's a lot of things that you might want to monitor. But if you look at it, what do you have in the photo? You see a pressure gauge. You see a motor control, a controller engine. That's really about it. It's not, not a super, what we would call a smart device. But there's a lot of things you might want to see. You might want to see the motor on off. You might want to see what the speed is, what the output size are, what it's actually outputting, all that sort of stuff. That's really trapped within the knowledge of that controller that you just need to extract. So how might you do that? Well, a lot of these devices do have connectivity to them. They have, maybe older devices have RS-232, maybe they have USB, whatnot, that you can passively interact with them. So you can build a nice little device that connects to that, queries that information, pulls it in, and then you need to send it to AWS. So how, how would you do that? Well, sorry, let's take a quick little oper uh, example. Let's take an operational activity. Let's, uh, let's take a look and see if we want to do uh, anomaly detection to see if uh, pills, uh, so with the tablets, are coming out the wrong speed or the wrong shape or something like that. So how might we do that? Well, first, we take our device, this new thing that we're connecting with RS-232 or something like that, we're gonna go and in, in, install the IoT SDK on top of it. With that, we're gonna have our device certificates. Then we're gonna run green, green grass on top of that. Inside of green grass, we're gonna have the green grass certificates saying what green grass can access, what it can't within the system. Then we're gonna have a slew of different functions. And I'm gonna make two coarse groupings, operational functions and business functions. By operational functions, I mean motor on, off, that sort of thing. For business functions, maybe how many tablets per hour it's expelling to the basket. So if we wanted to just code this up in a kind of a block diagram form, we could then take an operational function, maybe taking the head speed. We could send that on over to the AWS IoT topic for head speeds for this particular device, then apply it to a business rule that says, okay, we want to do anomaly detection on these particular readings. From that rule, we can then send it into Kinesis Firehose. Kinesis Firehose can then send it on over to S3, capturing all this raw data. That's pretty critical from a compliance standpoint. Now we know from all of our readings from this device, from the beginning of time, we have this immutable record of the, that data being tr transferred. But then we can also put on Kinesis Analytics and set up functions on that and say, if we ever exceed a certain threshold or if we're ever below a certain threshold, we're gonna trigger a Lambda to take some sort of action. That action is really up to us. So we could have it send it off to SNS, so someone gets an email, maybe they get a ping, a text message, or we record it in DynamoDB so we can have a dashboard and we can correlate it with other events or other system activities that take place. So this is kind of a, a very basic architecture. You see, you see it covered quite a lot in the, in the IoT space. But we're back to the question of uh, what, what defines this uh, versus those other conversations, and that's we really aren't talking much about regulation in this context. We're just talking about how you can wire this together. So let's dive into regulation concerns for a moment. So first and foremost, for most regulatory concerns, AWS can be considered off-the-shelf software. And by that I mean it falls under the existing compliance and legal guidelines that they would have for other consumer off-the-shelf software. Um, so think of it this way. The auditors and compliance folks can use their existing controls, maps, everything they do throughout the day and apply it onto AWS. And it's just a matter of mapping things left and right and how do you kind of adjust it to make it fit. So most folks are able to fit into that space. But there's some folks who have a regulatory niche where they have an, a little bit of extra that they need to go, or they have a little, let's say, um, a, a more nuanced approach at things. And that's where we get a concept called soup. And again, apologies for almost being dinner. Um, so when I say soup, what I mean is software of unknown provenance or software of unknown pedigree. What this kind of comes from is IEC 62304, which really has two major pieces. Start at the bottom one first, which says, that any software package that does not have adequate records of the development process or has not been developed for the purpose of being incorporated in a medical device. So let's take the bottom one in context in the order that I read them, uh, the adequate development process. That's not really that tall of a pull. Uh, on AWS, you have tons of records. Uh, you have all the certifications, attestations, and frameworks, tons of online documentation. You have your own processes. That's completely reasonable, not, not so bad. C completely practical. The top one has now been developed for a medical, or being incorporated in a medical device. If we think back 30 years or so, maybe, 
Um, this was quite common. People started with the breadboard, put the transistors, put the capacitors, built it all up using their internal processes, basically DIY'd everything for the sole single intent of what that device was built for. Completely fine. Fast forward to today, where you've got, um, think of your, like your motherboard today. Do you know whether or not the motherboard you're using has been designed to be incorporated with the medical device? How about your graphics card? Uh, how about any controllers you have on top of that? Let's up-level that a second. What about your operating system? Is your operating system designed for that? Maybe. Is it exclusively, I mean, in a black and white context? I, I, don't, I don't know. Up-level it even further. What about your frameworks like Java, uh, let's say Spring, JavaScript, et cetera? Are those? It's a pretty tough thing. So if you take this as a complete black and white, it's either soup, we cannot include it, or it's not soup and we can do it. You're really between DIY and no, no real option yourself. So Chris Hobbs in 2011 had a really great quote, which was an interpretation of this that says, it is not prohibited to use soup, but additional controls are needed and the risk needs to be taken into account. I think this is really important because what this is really saying is that this is not a black and white conversation. This is a risk conversation. And the risk conversation is what controls, what tools, what monitors do you have in place to drive that risk down as much as humanly possible to where your internal compliance folks are happy, the external folks are happy, um, uh, basically everyone has, is happy to the point that there's as little risk as humanly possible within the system. And that's pretty reasonable, right? That's, that's more than reasonable. And so that's where we get this idea of clear suit. And, and to be fair, this isn't just applied just to the life science industry. This also applies uh, so some other ISO, ISOs or IECs, IEC uh, 61508, ISO 62622. Let's think automated cars, powering electrical substations, things like that also have very similar controls. But again, it's a risk conversation. How are you driving down that risk and ensuring that nothing bad is happening? So again, when you're building this stuff out, you really have three options. You can build everything yourself, just DIY the whole thing. You can change your business case such that you're not in a nuanced industry and essentially you can use COTS or you can use what would be considered soup. Or you can take the extra steps of going through building out all the documentation and justification and let's say defensibility of your package, your software, your environment to be able to be used in a clear soup context. So now let's take an example. Let's imagine that we're building out a glucose meter. This could be anything but some sort of highly regulated device. There might be several things that we might want to do to be able to use this in a regulated context. So like first, we need to gather what documentation is available and out there for us to be able to use. We need to be able to register many devices, do so in a way that we can prove that whatever our source is and our destination is is completely traceable. We need to be able to do searching and reporting once we have those devices deployed. We need to be able to analyze the data flow such that if anything bad happens in our environment, we can see where that data is flowing. We need to be able to audit our environment to make sure that we're within our security and compliance controls. Um, then lastly, you know, if, in, if you ever get a knock on the door and you open the door and it's an external auditor wanting to take you out for coffee, what do you do in that situation? How, how do you handle that? So let's step through these uh, one by one. First, gathering documentation. Uh, the very first thing you should do is get with your compliance team, get with your legal folks. They're wonderful people. Get them involved, talk with them, um, they have a long experience of working with COT solutions, working with your existing software solutions. And so talk with them, get them on side, get them as part of your team. It may be an educational exercise, there may be things they need to learn, but once you have them on board, it can make your life immensely easier. Number two, as I mentioned before, AWS certifications, attestations, and frameworks. There's tons of great stuff there, like the SOC 2, ISO 9001, 27001, 27011. Lots of good stuff that you can use that really helps with the mapping exercise just right out the gate. Now, one thing I do want to say when I, when I talk about mapping, just for those who haven't been through this process before, um, sometimes you might see a, complete, a, a compliance regulation that says, well, you need to do X. Now, your internal legal or compliance team may actually say, you know, from our own disposition, you need to do X plus one. You need to do extra on top of that for us to feel comfortable doing that. That's quite common, um, and it's completely reasonable. It just gives you an opportunity to have a conversation with them to say, what is this X plus one? Why are we doing this? How does this fit within our context? And try to enlighten things and see what opportunities you have to kind of evolve their understanding, evolve your own understanding, and understand your disposition. Next up, uh, we have AWS Artifact. This is a uh, service that you're probably familiar with, but it's really great because you can go in there and you can pull up the SOC 2 reports, you can pull up the various ISOs, but there's other things in there as well. Take a look through there. So there's like the AWS Quality Management Report as well. 
These are all great backing documents that you can use for your um, uh, auditors. One last one to cover on this page, AWS white papers. White papers are great for two reasons. First reasons, they're just fantastic at their sole intent, right? So if you wanted to learn about security on AWS, there's no better place to go to than the AWS security white paper. Number two, there's a lot of discussion in those white papers to back up their claims. That, that discussion gives you insight into how AWS works. It gives a great understanding of, you know, here's the way that EC2 comes together to meet its various compliance needs um, associated with it. So it's a great little tool for that. But do keep in mind, it is a shared responsibility, right? Just because there's a ton of certifications and attestations, you still have responsibility on your side to make sure that you're doing everything right. So this starts in the most basic thing, making sure that all your data is you know, protected at all times, transit, uh, storage, et cetera, but also to making sure that you're following the best development practices possible, that you are designing your applications to be used in a medical context, that sort of thing. Okay, so let's talk about device management for a second. This is a service that came out earlier this year. And two features I want to dive into. First off, batch fleet provisioning, how you can provision a ton of devices at a time, but also real-time index and search, how you can kind of see what your estate is at any given moment. Now let's take an example. And this is somewhat of a, a real-life example. So um, I had a, another friend of mine who he had um, a, a startup, a very, very slim startup, and they're making devices, and they're making like 10 devices at a time, very, very small amount for basically prototyping type activities. They got a prospective customer, and the customer said, hey, can you guys ramp up immediately to 200,000? And he's like, oh, okay. Uh, from a supply chain perspective, yeah, we can do that. From a technology perspective, is, is that possible? And so they went through, they did a bunch of analysis, and they saw that, yeah, it was possible, but he had a point, a, a little pain point in, in this process. This pain point was, when they were previously doing things from a quick and dirty perspective, they had um, essentially a, a device manifest file would come in. Once it came in, they would have an EC2 M4X large that would just iterate over this file and then generate all the necessary CSRs associated with them. Totally fine. When they started doing the analysis for the 200,000 things, they saw we're only generating about five devices per second, uh, or uh, re creating and registering at five per second. So when you do the math on about 20,000 things, you come out with about 10 hours of it just grinding out CSRs. Um, he said, okay, well, that's, that's okay. Um, they also have it running on an EC2 instance, an M4X large. They have it, they're loading it all into an RDS. Like, it's also costing us thousands of dollars. Is it possible for you to design something that does it in a way that reduces our time? Because this time creates a blocker. As soon as the manifest comes in, their, their supply chain process waits until all those CSRs are generated, then it goes forward. So can we reduce that to next to nothing because this shouldn't be getting in the middle of it, as well as can you drive the cost down? So I, I took it as just a, a fun little exercise, and so I work, went over to his place and we worked, worked through it, and with that we came up with this architecture. So first, what we did is we started with the inventory run report. So this is uh, a run report that basically specifies the devices. This has like firmware, uh, version, all the sort of stuff that you might expect with it. We then decided, well, we have to chunk it because the 200,000 number is arbitrary. It really could be 100, it could be 2 million. It really depends on how successful the product is. So we need an architecture that scales either way. And with that, we basically chunk it. And so what that means is we take the 200,000, split it up into chunks. We chose an arbitrary chunk of 800 units. I'll kind of explain that in a little bit, but 800 different devices are chunked up. So essentially those, um, those devices are split into around 200 different reports, 250 their reports. They're stored off into S3, and then a message says, go and process these, uh, these devices. From there, we need to go and split them. So with the splitting, um, what we found is that if we just took the 200 and we ran CSRs on them, they took about 10 minutes, give or take, to go and process those, but they'd kind of get this staggering effect where you're not really utilizing um, the full breadth of your lambdas available. Essentially, one could end up getting kind of blocked up, and they wouldn't necessarily stagger effectively, so we split it up even further. So let's split it up into chunks of 20 each, so each one runs very, very fast. From there, they all generate the CSRs. So it takes them, basically generates the CSR, and then generates a bulk registration file that can be used later. So this is it. This is kind of the, the, the basis of the main workflow. But as I mentioned before, one of the things that they wanted to do was be able to have assurance that this whole process runs successfully, so they needed a reconciliation. So on that, we added an event that would run, a, a periodic event, so once the job started, it would start this timer. Every five minutes, it would check and make sure, did all these devices come through? Can we reconcile all the CSRs? Can we reconcile everything about it? 
If so, if it all reconciles, we're gonna send it on over to device management to go and register these things. Great, so now it's in device management, but what do we kind of then still need to follow up and make sure that that worked correctly? So we added another time-based event where essentially once all those devices are registered, the register monitor says great, sends a message and says, hey, everything's completed, go about your day. Okay, so if we look at this architecturally, compared to just an EC2 and an RDS, more complicated. I give that absolutely. If we look from a actual uh, maintainability standpoint, there's no patching, there's no managing, there's no maintaining, okay, less complicated, so that's nice, kind of washes out there. If we look for difficulty, so this took three hours to create, give or take, took about 150 lines of code. It's not much. Um, all said and done, through testing, scaling up and down, we spent a day to create this architecture. So that's completely reasonable when wanting to roll something like this out. So then we decide, okay, let's look at the metrics to see if he met his objectives. So actually going through, running 200,000 devices, before doing this took about nine hours, nine and a half. Doing it this way took five minutes. So the process isn't blocked, it's over and done, five minutes. This is not like a business value process, this is just generating the CSRs and making sure everything is aligned and reconciled. That's completely acceptable. Then we had to look at cost. What's the cost associated with this? So we priced out all the lambdas as they executed. The main big pull within this was the CSR generation. It cost around 66 cents. We also had to consider S3. There's a lot of gits, so that's um, certainly part of it. And, and the reason there's a lot of gits is we had thought about using like DynamoDB or using RDS, but they just use it as a hash. They just have a manifest file with all these CSRs and they just wanna make sure everything's there. No reason for that, just use S3 for that. It's basically an index hash as it is. So that's relatively cheap. Bulk registration, that was free. So the total cost was around 81 cents. So they went previously where they were spending a few thousand dollars, which isn't perhaps a lot, but to a startup, that, that could be a make or break, down to 81 cents every time they wanted to execute for a much more uh, streamlined and manageable environment. So let's dive a little deeper. Um, how does this actually work for the registration? The registration file is broken up into four pieces. The first piece is the parameters. When these parameters are basically variable declarations that you're gonna use in the bulk registration process. So you can see things like your thing, thing name, your serial numbers, uh, your CSR definition. You also have your resource. This is your actual object instantiation. So you'll see things like uh, your different properties, like your thing name. This is gonna map into the IoT thing, so it's gonna be that thing name that's associated with that, as well as other attributes that you might wanna have there, like the serial number or the firmware version. Next up, you have your certificate. Um, pretty simple, again, you just do your IoT certificate and you specify your CSR, back referencing that variable, and then you need to specify a policy with that. So in this case here, we're just specifying a policy that allows it to post, uh, or to publish, rather, to, to any topic. You might restrict it based on your, your scenario. But that's really it, just those four pieces. And then you get your specification file, or your generation file. And you can see it's very, very readable. You have your serial number, your firmware version, your CSR, all in one nice file that you can hand off to anyone who needs to evaluate or audit the system to make sure that everything matches up with the original specification, everything was done, everything was created, and it's all kind of buttoned up together at the end. The actual uh, execution of the uh, bulk registration, pretty simple, specify your template file, specify your bucket, specify your key to that particular bucket, and then it runs and generates you a task ID. This is basically your callback ID to figure out how that bulk registration went. Once you do that, you get a nice result. You can see status completed, generated a thousand uh, different items, and that's pretty much it. If you need a report afterwards, again, also great to keep, so you have all these reports on hand, so in case anyone comes back later, you can do a results or an errors report. Both of these generate nice little CSV files where you can see how the system ran um, and what, what the results of each one of those are. So you can basically log that off to the side to say, okay, we expected it to generate a thousand uh, things. Here's a report showing all a thousand things were registered in the system. Now, if you want to dive deeper in how this actual was coded out, there's a great blog post created by Chris Snowden. Uh, he dives into how you can code out device management, how you can build that out within that system. Uh, recommend you take a look at that. Great follow on with this. He doesn't go through so much of the orchestration associated with it, uh, but that's following pretty normal patterns. And again, it, didn't, it only took like three hours to code up, so it's not, it's not uh, too terribly difficult. Now let's talk searching and reporting. So we've deployed all our items, we have our estate out there, we know what it looks like, but we wanna know certain things about our estate. Like maybe we wanna know what version of firmware that various devices have that are out there. 
Uh, the first way we can do it is we can certainly use uh, device management index and search. Within index and search, we can do basic queries and see what, what it looks like, but some folks like to slice and dice quite a bit more to aggregations, joins, and things like that. For those cases, what folks do is take the device list, export it out to S3, load it into Athena, and then visualize it within QuickSight. So kind of showing that in a bit more detail. So index and search, of course, you can do a list things, pass in attribute name, value, et cetera, and it will restrict your results to whatever you want it to be. So essentially you're searching across your estate that way. You can also take that data, put it into Athena. That allows you to then write SQL queries. So you can now have like a query like this where you're selecting uh, the device RN and serial number where the uh, firmware version is 1204, get a nice result that way. Or even better yet, tying that into QuickSight where you can get nice little graphs. Um, so here's a graph across an estate that I was uh, playing around with. And you can see here very quickly that only 12% of my estate is running the most current firmware version of 1206. 28% uh, of the estate is running the initial 1202 firmware, or more aptly put, very quickly you see that 88% of my estate is running an out-of-date firmware, so I need to take some sort of action. Now let's talk about analyzing the data flow, how you wanna do that, and this here, CloudWatch Logs is your friend. CloudWatch Logs has a ton of really cool stuff, all around uh, broker connects, disconnects, subscriptions, what's happening with the rules, what's happening with the job engines, Let's give a quick little example. Maybe we want to see with one particular device is publishing within our CloudWatch logs, we see this device does a publish in, so this is a new message coming in. It's associated with this particular client ID, so we know that this client is publishing the message. We then know it's going to match against a rule, so this is a rule match, the message came in, rules matched. It's the same client ID, so hey, success there. And it's gonna go over to this particular um, rule name. So it's now gonna call my important business rule or whatever, and then map on over that way. We now have our subway map from the message coming in all the way to the rule being invoked and the lambda being called that that, that rule is tied to. Now let's talk about defense of the estate. Um, so uh, IoT de Device Defender came out last year as well. There's one piece of this I wanna hit, which is device audits. Um, really nice when talking with your auditors about as well. Essentially, this allows you to go and um, take uh, your state and then run a set of predefined checks against your state. So like maybe you wanna know, like we mentioned just a little bit ago, the client ID is pretty critical. If all of a sudden you have devices that are coming through sharing the same client ID across multiple invocations, you can then go here, run this on a daily basis, and see, okay, these are bad things that are happening, we need to take action. Also important uh, that we commonly see is certificates. If certificates leak, or maybe folks are reusing the same certificate across multiple devices, detecting that out so you can take action. There's also less, perhaps, risky things like maybe logging's disabled on the device. So all of a sudden, logging's disabled, you might wanna take action to go and re-enable it on that device. Um, also might be just you're saving space on the device because it doesn't have the storage associated. Um, the other nice thing about this is you can run it on a periodic basis. So if you're running this every day and you run it for a year, you now have a map of what your estate's doing, who and what is compliant within your estate. And so over time, again, this gives you just a, another artifact to use as part of your uh, defensible discussions. Now, I'd be remiss when talking about this stuff to not talk about CloudFormation. Infrastructure as code is absolutely critical. Um, basically, if you can create an infrastructure that's completely immutable and defined by CloudFormation, that's awesome. You now have a spec file that defines exactly what your environment looks like. You can take that spec file, you can hand it on to uh, whoever needs to know, and they know exactly what AMIs, what the VPC looks like, what the networking rules are, all that stuff um, downstream. So pretty, pretty cool. But sometimes that's, there's, there's drift that happens, you know, environments change, things like that. That's where config comes into play. Being able to give your auditors a, a glimpse of what can, what's happening with config, who's changed what since the initial inception of the environment, how it has um, changed from moment A to moment B, uh, absolutely a great tool to put in their hands. Uh, there was also CloudFormation Drift that was also announced relatively recently, another tool in this estate, but I find config to be the most useful when talking with folks. Okay. Next up, um, is using I, uh, AWS services to maintain a level of compliance. So um, as I mentioned earlier, there was the HLC 302 presentation that was done earlier today. This goes into way in-depth in coverage of this, not much longer time than I currently have to dive into it. 
Uh, but there is also a blog post. This blog post was created by Chris Crosby. It goes into how you would go and build out this estate, how you would make it completely, uh, continually compliant to make sure that if anyone changes anything in the environment, if they adjust anything, it reacts to it or it doesn't allow that behavior to happen in the first place. So a wonderful blog post uh, to take a look at. And I do want to note, just because this is HIPAA, it's totally uh, applicable across um, any regulated spaces, because really this is just a discussion of how can you build continual compliance. It's not how you can build healthcare continual compliance. It's really just a generic topic. Now let's talk about where to go if you have an external audit. Um, two areas to help. We get asked uh, uh, quite often, who, who can we go to? Well, you can go to your AWS account team. You can go to them first of all. They can help. They can see who they can reach out to, um, what uh, services are available within AWS to help your particular questions that you might have. We've also been skilling up our professional services team, and so we have folks who come from an audit background who are familiar working with auditors, answering their questions, doing that sort of thing. So you can bring them in as well to help you through this particular audit. Um, so a couple tools there to help you out, to help you through that particular process. So you're certainly not alone. We're here to help. So in summary, so in summary, IoT is growing rapidly across all industries. As, you know, as we mentioned before, across consumer, across industry, across um, uh, the research space, across everything, it's growing. Now, most industries are, are lucky in a way. They can classify AWS as COTS. They can use their existing mappings and controls. Everything works out that way. Those who are in more nuanced industries, there's means of using like ClearSoup, and that's really just a best practice. How can you build all your maps and controls to define your risk down to the, the most minimal possible? Um, there's many tools within AWS to help you make that ClearSoup definition. So be that, as I mentioned before, CloudFormation, be that config, uh, be that new services. So just yesterday there was announced uh, IoT events that might help as well, so it's event triggering. All these things are tools that are in the toolbox to help you to go and make your environment as uh, secure and compliant as possible. So lastly, it's easy to get started. As I mentioned with the example of rolling out 200,000 devices, it took a couple hours to build out a full framework for rolling out 200,000 devices. So you can get started, anyone can get started. It's not so much a technology conversation or is it possible, it's just a matter of uh, what are the steps that you need to do to be able to go and do this within your particular environment. Or get started with POCs and things like that. It's just easy to get going. So with that, I'm gonna hand on over to Rich with Philips to talk about your experience with IoT and AWS. Thanks, Chris. Oh, so backwards is working again. <laughs> so uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so uh, most of you, uh, if, if, any, if you're coming from the healthcare space, know who Philips is. We've been around for quite a while. We've got products across all the domains inside of healthcare. Uh, we also have a very wide consumer platform. And I think <clears throat> one of the things that I just want to challenge Chris a little bit on his, on his uh, presentation is IoT is new. It is growing. It's everywhere, but it's not new. So we've been doing a lot of the patterns that, that Chris has been talking about for decades. We just didn't call it IoT. And we did it in closed networks. We did it in closed systems. Phillips has been collecting machine data off of machines for a very long time. We've been acting on that. We've been doing preventive maintenance based on that data. What's different today is the shared resource model. And it's a huge challenge because uh, I think I also kind of cringed a little. Meet your compliance people. The challenge with meeting the compliance people is not that they're not there to support you, is that all of this is scary and different. Um, we're relying on people that they don't control, they can't see, they don't trust, they don't know they even exist in a lot of cases. So I do, I do agree that we have to engage them early, and I do agree that there's a huge education piece that we have, to, we have to take up, especially in the engineering community, to help them understand where the boundaries are and help them understand how Amazon can support these things as much as get them to buy into this. It's, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a journey. So a quick summary on what HealthSuite is. Um, HealthSuite is the cloud platform for Philips and for Philips external partners. Um, it is built primarily on top of AWS. 99% of what we have comes from AWS. We extend those services. We add our own capabilities to it. And uh, I think we enrich greatly uh, a lot of what comes from AWS. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is that 
our entire application can't live solely inside of AWS. We have on-premise components. We have solutions that span continents. We have consumers that span continents. So uh, we'll talk about that for a second. Uh, an example of some of the domains that we play in, this is not all inclusive, it's just a sample. We're trying to adhere to simultaneously in our platforms regulations that are cross-country, cross-region, cross-domain. If you look across the entire healthcare continuum, across the whole care cycle, it involves clinical applications, it involves consumer applications, it involves data that the consumers are providing to you. All of this comes together in a common system. So different regulations apply and different contexts apply, and we're trying to make sense of that in, in our solutions. The, the, the landscape is also changing constantly. In some cases, week to week, month to month. Um, there's not a lot of coordination. So uh, the regulations that we're dealing with vary highly, region to region. As I mentioned before, you know, uh, we have a highly mobile population. We'll talk about that in a second. We have uh, changing rules for existing data. So some of my data sets go back decades. Rules may come tomorrow that say that data that you had for a long time, you have to treat differently. So we're trying to adapt to that. How do you apply those, those rules to data that you may have collected long before you collected all the information about how you collected it, why you collected it, what the, what the context was? We now have withdrawal of consent for some data. So data that you were authorized to collect in some circumstances, you may suddenly have to take out. But there may be other data adjacent to it that you have to keep. So we're trying to adapt to that. And then we have conflicts between regulations in the security space and the privacy space. In the privacy space, you want to protect that information or protect the interests of the individual. In the security space, you may need to keep some of it just so you can go back and audit what you're doing. And so it's a constant balance that we're trying to maintain. Um, I want to talk quickly about some of the use cases that we're trying to deal with in the healthcare space. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to combine data from various sources, some of it clinically connected, collected, some of it collected by just common uh, uh, consumer devices. You think about an, uh, an Apple Watch, for example. And then you have data that, that the, the consumer enters, and do you trust that? And so each of those have different rules around it, and what we're forced to do with, with these solutions is to collect the context in which that data is, is collected at the time of collection, and what we do with it later is important. Um, the provider supply to data is part of a permanent record, so we know that that has to be persisted for a very long time, if not forever. In the same system that we built for, um, on top of our IoT solution, we have consumer-provided data that may, be, may have limits on how long we have to keep it, may have to be thrown out at some point, may have to go away if the, if the patient withdraws their consent or the consumer withdraws their consent. Um, that really comes down to right to forget, which is popping up everywhere, as, as many of you know. Um, so how do we make all this work? So Chris described you know, one architecture. Um, we, have our, we have our own architecture, which is primarily built on top of it. In the center of, uh, of the solution is an IAM solution we built that stores an enormous amount of information about the context, about the users of the platform, about the providers, about the people like me who might have access to certain th systems, but not the data itself. And with the data, we have to collect certain things that we wouldn't really do before and we didn't do previously. So consent and context in IoT is important for a lot of these regulated cases. Why did I collect this data? Was it collected as part of a patient engagement? Was it collected because the doctor or the physician or the care provider said, I want you to track your activity? Now, it's not really clinical data, but the provider may use it. Knowing where that data came from and the, and the circumstances in which it's collected is going to be really important later when the rules change. And so that's important. Locale is becoming increasingly uh, important. So if I'm a French citizen and I am operating under rules where my healthcare data needs to be stored locally or in, an, in a ASIP certified environment, but I have a smartwatch, or I have healthcare-related, a wearable sensor, ooh, sorry, wearable sensor that's collecting information about my, my, uh, about my heart, and I travel to another regime. I travel to the US. Where does that data get stored? How can I access data? Can a physician in the US access that data if it's stored in France? All of this data information is going to become increasingly important as the rules tighten around privacy and management. If you don't collect it at the time of activity or you don't 
log that at the time of activity, it's going to be very, very hard for us to go back and apply rules later. And increasingly, we're having to make decisions about retaining data because we can't prove its, its provenance. We don't know where it came from. We don't know what rules apply. So a lot of what we've done is built adjacent to this systems to track that. Um, data leakage. That's, this one's becoming, as we get audited more, this one's becoming increasingly challenging because traditionally our IT domains, the administrators and sysadmins have had access, yeah, extensive access to the data. We trust them. There are processes in place. But it's harder to articulate that you have tight controls. So increasingly, we're abstracting away the access of that data from the underlying system administrators. Now, Chris has described a system where a lot of this doesn't actually have to be worried about. But as I mentioned earlier, we've got systems that cross multiple domains. We have hardware on site. We have, um, we have systems that span multiple countries. And so we want to make sure that as the data moves through the system, that everybody who's able to access those underlying systems can't get out of the, at, the, at the data. Tracking that at an object level is really hard to do, and we've, we've, we've built systems adjacent to it to do that. In the end, object level controls are what matter. So if you're going to combine data from multiple sources, if we're going to deal with data that moves through different regimes, if we have rules that are changing, if we want to go back and retroactively apply it, to be able to filter and sort that data and say, all of this data applies, is affected by this new rule, you've got to be able to tease that out. Collecting just the individual object data, the heart rate at this moment in time, is not sufficient. Where that was collected, all of that data, being able to build rule mechanisms on top of it is, is absolutely critical. So we've built metadata collections that, in some cases, have more metadata than the object itself. We've built systems to allow us to go through and apply new rules to old data and filter and sort and separate. Do I need to remove this, move this data from one region to another because I can no longer store it outside the country's borders? OK, great. Which, which data is that? So that's part of where I think some of the complexity comes in. It's getting very, very easy to create these systems, it's getting very, very easy to build a, a, a very quick mechanism to collect data and store it it's much harder to build the, the, the complex mechanisms to manage that data. And that's a lot of what we're, what we're working on. Um, I think that's it, because I had a very short window. Um, we can talk more afterwards if people have individual questions. Chris, back to you. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, so, so with that, I just want to say uh, thanks, Rich. Thanks for presenting. Thanks for uh, talking about Phil's experience. And I, I guess we just want to say so thank you um, for everyone here. We appreciate it. Um, being we have, I guess we have a bit of time to we have a bit of time. Do we want to take some questions? Any questions in the audience? Okay. Well, then, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Don't forget to fill out your survey. <laughs> have a wonderful day.